Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Dan Churchwell, and I'm the Director of Program Outreach here at the Acton Institute. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor O. Carter Sneed for our August Acton Lecture Series. Professor Sneed teaches at Notre Dame Law School and is a concurrent professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. And he's the director of the Institute D. Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture. He is one of the world's leading experts in public bioethics and the governance of science, medicine, and biotechnology in the name of ethical goods. His research explores issues relating to neuroethics, enhancement, human embryo research, assisted reproduction, abortion, and end-of-life decision-making. His most recent uh, book is What It Means to be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics, and is named one of the 10 best books of the year by the Wall Street Journal in, in 2020. We are looking forward to having his lecture, and at the end of the lecture, he will join us live for Q&A. So you can submit your questions on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, or on email at digital at acton.org. Thank you, and enjoy the lecture. Good afternoon. I'm Carter Sneed. <clears throat> I'm a professor at the University of Notre Dame Law School. I'm also the director of the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture. I'm proud and grateful to the organizers of this event for being able to uh, supply you all with one of your monthly lectures at the Acton Institute, which is an essential nonprofit in the ecosystem uh, of American thought, especially American conservative and libertarian thought. I've been pleased uh, that my, your wonderful colleague, Dan Churchwell, has invited me today to come and talk a little bit about the themes of my book, What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics, which was published in October of 2020 uh, by Harvard University Press. This is obviously a recorded uh, session here. Uh, I'm not live and in person yet, but I will be live and in person with you as you watch this to answer your questions and to engage in conversation, which is far always a more fruitful experience than listening passively to my prepared remarks. But <clears throat> be that as it may, that is what we're doing right now. And um, the title of my lecture this afternoon is the same as the title of my book, which is what it means to be human, the case for the body in public bioethics. And the claims of the talk are the same as the claims of the book, albeit in a more truncated fashion. The first claim of the book is a methodological claim. The claim is that the richest and most potent method of analyzing matters of public bioethics is through what I describe as an inductive anthropological inquiry. Uh, it's really not as highfalutin as it sounds. All I mean by inductive anthropological inquiry is to ask the question, uh, what is the vision of human identity and flourishing that anchors and animates the law and public policy under consideration? So the best way in, in other words, to these questions is to do it anthropologically, is to ask the question of what it means to be human uh, according to the premises of the laws and policies under discussion. And then you can take a step back and ask whether or not uh, the, the, the law and policy is resting upon an accurate and, and valid understanding of what it means to be human, or uh, if it is, if it's not, then that's one angle of critique that one could mount, but if it's not uh, resting on, uh, or sorry, if it is resting on a valid uh, vision of what it means to be and flourish as a human being, you can then evaluate the relationship between means and ends, examine the doctrine and the policies and the black letter law, and to see how well it follows from the initial anthropological premises. So that's a methodological claim I make in the book. The second claim was a substantive claim. The substantive claim is, um, is uh, an analysis or really I, or a substantive claim arises from applying the method uh, that I just described, the anthropological analysis to the three vital conflicts of American public bioethics. That is the law and public policy concerning abortion, uh, the law concerning assisted reproductive technologies, and the law relating to end-of-life decision-making, including assisted suicide. When you analyze these three areas of the law uh, pursuant to the inductive anthropological analysis that I just mentioned, what comes to the surface is a vision of human identity and flourishing that is false and impoverished and turns out to actually be dangerous for those law and policymakers who's, who are tasked with the job of crafting 
uh, laws and policies in the areas of American public bioethics. The dominant anthropology that comes to the surface when you apply this inductive anthropological inquiry uh, very closely resembles what Robert Bella, social scientist, and Charles Taylor, a philosopher, uh, and others have referred to as expressive individualism. And I'll say a lot more in a moment about what I mean by that and sort of unpack that particular vision of human identity and human flourishing. But for present purposes, it's sufficient to say that when you analyze expressive individualism, what you see is that it cannot and does not make sense of the lived reality of human embodiment, along with the vulnerability, reciprocal indebtedness, and natural limits that come along inexorably for every embodied being. And thus, expressive individualism is not a suitable foundation for American public bioethics. And to embrace it as we do in these three vital conflicts is to open a pathway towards laws that are not just, they're not humane, and they're not true to lived human reality. So the framework of the talk is pretty straightforward. I'll begin by very briefly describing public bioethics, what I mean by this a particular term. Then I'm gonna unpack a little more uh, uh, the methodological claim of the book. I'll, un I'll unpack and, and sort of explain uh, what I mean by an anthropological analysis of law. And, and, and along with that, give a justification for why I think that's the most fruitful point of entry into these questions. What does anthropology have to do with law and public policy generally? I'll very briefly engage that question in this section of my talk. Then I will spend some time talking about expressive individualism and critiquing it as an incomplete conception of the self that is forgetful of the body, to borrow a phrase from my colleague, Alistair McIntyre. Then I will suggest that the corrective that's needed uh, in the law and policy in this domain is a kind of remembering of the body. That is an anthropological corrective that takes seriously the goods and practices and virtues of our shared embodied lives. That is to say, an anthropology that takes seriously what it means to be and flourish as a being who is, not merely has, but is a living body. And if there's time, I will uh, try to make these somewhat abstract observations and arguments concrete by focusing on one of the three of the vital conflicts that I take up in the book, namely the law of assisted reproduction. So let's press ahead. When I say public bioethics, what I mean is the governance of science, medicine, and biotechnology in the name of ethical goods. Whereas bioethics is a mere field of intellectual inquiry, public bioethics is the point at which the law comes into contact with these questions, these ethical questions arising from advances in biomedical science and biotechnology. It's the work of the elected branches of government, the, the legislatures, both at the state and federal level, uh, the executive branch at both state and federal level, as well as even the courts in these two, um, at the, those two levels as well. Now, public bioethics as an area of law and public policy is fundamentally concerned with human vulnerability, dependence, frailty, and finitude. It's about procreation and pregnancy and babies and wasting illnesses, devastating injuries, desperate enrollees in, cl in clinical trials, fearful patients, the disabled, the elderly, the dying, and the dead. Put another way, Public bioethics is most deeply about the meaning and consequences of human embodiment. The fact that we experience ourselves, one another, and the world around us in, and more importantly, as living and dying bodies. Now, the issues in American public bioethics since its inception in the, in the late 60s and early 1970s span a very broad uh, area of human concern. They began in the crucible of questions associated with protections involving human subjects of research, but quickly moved on to many, many more topics, including the three areas of vital conflict, assisted reproduction, abortion, and end-of-life decision-making, which I will take up in my remarks this evening. So let's then grapple with the fundamental question of the methodology that I'm arguing for. What on earth does law have to do with anthropology. And just to be clear, as I mentioned moments ago, when I say anthropology, I'm not talking about the modern uh, social science discipline that's studied in colleges and universities. What I'm talking about is anthropology understood in its original sense of what it means to be a human being, what it means to flourish as a human being. And this is deeply connected to questions of law because law is about and for the protection and flourishing of persons. 
it, it couldn't be otherwise. What law is for is the protection and flourishing of persons. Now, the law is a very fine-grained instrument. Not uh, everything is simply the binary of prohibition and permit uh, prohibit prohibition and permission. That's not. It's not that simple. There's a broad spectrum of regulatory activities with which the law can shape human behavior, punishing certain behaviors, deterring certain behaviors, encouraging other behaviors, especially in the area of American public bioethics. At the permissive end of the spectrum, we have things active encouragement through, let's say, federal funding. And then at the most restrictive end of the spectrum, we, of course, have criminal prohibition and punishment. But between those two poles, there's an enormous amount of space, including large swaths in which the law can simply um, uh, allow for private ordering. The law can, can simply uh, take a passive role and, and allow for private ordering. Um, but no matter what the form of the law or public policy, ultimately it is grounded in its purpose, which is to say, to promote the flourishing of persons or to provide for their protection. And because that's what law is for, because it's oriented towards the well-being of persons, it therefore unavoidably rests upon usually undeclared conceptions of human identity. The law has to have a theory of what a person is if, the law, if we're even to understand uh, if the law is succeeding in its goals or if it's merely arbitrary and capricious. The law has to have a conception of what a person is if the purpose of law is to promote the flourishing of persons. So accordingly, the richest and deepest understanding of law is, I argue, anthropological. It is the uh, point of, of entry that in which we analyze the vision of human identity and flourishing in which the law is anchored. So the first question in an anthropological analysis, obviously, is who and what does the law assume a person to be? And then you ask the, the sort of critical question of, well, is the law built on a true or false understanding uh, of human nature? And when I analyzed the laws and public policies connected to these three vital conflicts of American public bioethics, what came to the surface was quite troubling. The vision of the human person and human flourishing was, as I said earlier at the outset of my remarks, uh, very closely aligned with what has been described as expressive individualism. And expressive individualism understands the person as an isolated, unencumbered, atomized individual self. This is the sense in which it is radically individualistic. The fundamental unit of reality is the individual self, abstracted from and shorn of all constitutive attachments or, or, or relationships, uh, abstracting from its, uh, uh, the, how it's situated uh, into historical context, traditional context, all of that falls away. The fundamental unit of reality is the atomized individual self. And this self is defined by its will or its capacity to formulate desires. Everything else is instrumental to that end. The body is instrumental, our relationships are instrumental, the natural world is instrumental. The person, you and I, are defined exclusively as according to our will. That's So our will or our mind are who we are, right? Not our bodies, not our relationships, not our uh, how we, where we, what stories we find ourselves a part of. We are coextensive exclusively with our will. And the person is thus defined as an individual chooser uh, or consumer. And human flourishing is defined as the pursuit of projects of your own invention or your own construction. There's an imperative to live your originality, to, to interrogate the depths of the interior of the self. The sentiments that we find inside the inner voice is what's morally definitive. Nothing outside is morally definitive. We are, to use Michael Sandel's phrase, a self-originating source of valid claims. The, all that matters, the only thing that's decisive for our choices are the, is the voice inside and the authentic truths that it expresses and according to which we configure our life plan. This is a, um, a vision of the human person. First of all, it's dualistic, right? It distinguishes the mind from the body in a radical way. You are your mind, you're your will, you're your bundle of desires. Everything else is accidental and instrumental, okay? And accordingly, it is also profoundly anti-teleological, to use a philosophical phrase. That is to say that there's no sense in which external givens of nature, of your form, of your relationships, of the natural world, of your natural mechanisms of action. There's no sense at all in which those external givens are normative. Only thing that is normative is the unique and original inner voice. That's what's definitive. 
And within this framework, because we are atomized individual wills whose flourishing consists in interrogating the depths of ourselves and pursuing our dreams and configuring our life plans accordingly, there are no unchosen obligations. There are no constitutive attachments. There's no one who has a claim, can lay a claim on me that can ask me to do something or to be something that I don't choose in advance. Uh, and moreover, there are no constitutive attachments. My family, my, my vocation, the thing, my friends, the, my community, my tradition, my religion, none of that is constitutive of my identity. It's all instrumental. It's all external and instrumental. It is not me. It is, it is the thing that I choose to do in the moment for the purposes of my life plan as I construct it. Similarly, personal relationships are viewed through this lens as instrumental uh, and transactional. And in fact, of course, while people can come together and collaborate, atomized wills can come together and collaborate, it's also a universe of strife. It's a universe of atomized individual wills seeking to overbear one another. And persons uh, encounter one another in this sense as isolated adversaries, to borrow Carl Schneider's frame, phrase from the University of Michigan Law School, clad in the armor of their rights. And if we're to think about what ethics looks like through this lens, it becomes very, very compressed and truncated and reduced to simply the question of autonomy. Uh, autonomy is the highest goods to, it, to which all others are subordinated. And injustice is reconceived as constraints on freedom, my freedom, to pursue projects of my own choosing. And by extension, the role of government in social life is to remove those constraints, those public constraints, those private constraints, possibly even natural constraints, that, uh, and otherwise provide for the conditions for the assertion of the unencumbered individual self. So this is a very attractive vision in a certain way, right? The idea of the solitary individual bestriding the universe, imposing his or her will, bending it to, to suit the internal truths, the endogenous truths that are only knowable by me, that are authentic to me, that are original to me. It's a very sexy image, if you will, a very romantic image. And I use the word romantic intentionally because expressive individualism became extraordinarily popular with the romantic poets and literary figures um, uh, of the 18th and 19th centuries. And these individuals, these poets and artists um, embrace this notion. Now, they're a little different from its modern iteration of expressive individualism in the sense that they believed in a kind of universal nature the voice of which could be heard inside and through listening to the into the depths of the of the voice within. That's it becomes radically relativized in its modern iteration. Uh, in the according to Robert Bella's findings in the late 1960s and 1970s, it becomes everyone becomes his or her own measure. It's not simply a, a notion of shared universal natural voice, but rather everyone has his or her own voice. Um, but it it's, it it makes sense when you think about it that this is a a kind of ideological movement that, that really uh, originated uh, first with Rousseau, but then of course with these literary figures and these artistic figures, but then it becomes translated for the more general population uh, in, in the 20th century, in the 60s and 70s. So what's the problem? I mean, it's a kind of attractive uh, vision, especially one that a lot of, you know, um, teenage boys would be really attracted to, for example, or teenage girls for that matter those who are ex excited about imposing their will and bending the world to their will. Um, the problem is it's false. The problem is that it is, it is a, a, at best a mere snapshot of the life of an individual who has a body. Uh, being embodied means certain things. And expressive individualism can't make sense of the body because the body is a mere instrument through, under the auspices of expressive individualism. Lived embodied reality, that is as a being, who lives as a body, vulnerable, fragile, corruptible in time, means that we are uh, mutually dependent upon one another, for example. No one can live on his or her own. There is no such thing as the state of nature in which the radical, atomized individual will, uh, you know, uh, under only his or her own powers, you know, blazing their pathway uh, in the universe. That's just a, a fiction. That's never... That's, that's even of the most able-bodied and powerful people, they're still radically dependent upon other people by virtue of their embodiment. We're all subject to natural limits. And this isn't, again, I mean, the very best case scenario is you begin your life in complete and utter dependence upon the beneficence of others as an infant, and you gradually follow an arc upwards 
gathering your powers, and then you hit an apex. Uh, if we're lucky, most people are not this lucky. We uh, apex where you are able to formulate and impose your will and to and to to do as you wish. But then immediately you begin this sort of gradual, at best, decline into total dependence once again. So expressive individualism, for the very best case scenario, is a brief snapshot at the very top of the arc, and it's only a moment in our lifespan, and uh, it's only a moment by virtue of the fact that we're embodied, fragile, needy beings who depend on one another. And the fundamental need for embodied beings uh, to flourish is what McIntyre calls networks of unconditional and uncalculated giving and graceful receiving. That is, networks of people who are willing to make the good of another uh, their own good without seeking anything in return. We need this, first of all, for our basic survival. Unless our parents or someone else, usually our parents, made our good their good when we were born, we wouldn't even be here right now. And, it, and it's not a brief period of time of dependence in the human species on parents. We're, we're dependent for a very long time, radically dependent for a very long time, more so than most other mammals. But it's not just for basic survival that we depend on these networks of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving. People who are willing to give without asking anything in return. We also depend on these networks for our flourishing, which I argue is to become the thing that we're, very, that we're meant to be, namely to become the kind of person who can make the good of others without seeking anything in return. And as we become these beings who can give without seeking anything in return to others, uh, it not only guarantees the sustainability of these networks, which are essential for human, human survival and flourishing, but also you internalize the reality that that is what human flourishing is. Human beings are, by virtue of their embodiment, made for love and friendship. That's what it means to be human. And we're most human when we're taking care of one another in this way. <clears throat> but expressive individualism can't see this, this lived reality. It's unable to recognize the unchosen claims of the weak, including children, born and unborn, the disabled <clears throat> and the elderly, because it exists in the world of contracts. It exists in the world of consent and bargain for exchange, because everything is about pressing towards your own self-invented destiny, right? And perhaps we collaborate with others. Others mean things to us within that framework. But sometimes if that person ceases to become useful or that relationship ceases to become useful, it falls away. There's no such thing as an unchosen claim that can be vindicated. There's no such thing as an unearned privilege uh, that, that, uh, that a person can invoke with us. Everything is in the domain of consent. Uh, and it leads to loneliness and dislocation and alienation because there's no constitutive attachments. It's death haunted because as Solzhenitsyn says, when you become the center of your universe, when you're the only point in the universe that matters, your death constitutes the extinction of the entire universe in one stroke. And that is a very frightening thing. Indeed, and Bella, Robert Bella, in his findings, and Charles Taylor in his own philosophical reflections, have worried uh, and have, have the evidence to worry about the erosion of social and familial ties when people begin to embrace expressive individualism. So how do we fix this problem? How do we fix the problem of expressive individualism? We do so by remembering the body, by embracing the goods and practices and virtues for lived embodied reality. Recall what we need for flourishing are these networks of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving. They're necessary for survival and to learn to become the thing that we're supposed to be. Um, and that requires both practicing the virtues that I'm about to articulate, but it also requires the cultivation of the moral imagination. So you can see the other, the vulnerable other. You can see your own vulnerability, your own vulnerability in the past as an infant and your own vulnerability, which you're inexorably moving towards God willing, as an elderly person, um, and, and you can see that, you can see your own vulnerability and the vulnerability of others. Now, there are many people who never leave the condition of total vulnerability. Many of our brothers and sisters are profoundly disabled, or they become disabled later in life. And it's important to see ourselves in those individuals as well, and to reach out and to care for those individuals. And again, as McIntyre says, we all, we, we all exist on a scale of disability. So what are these virtues and goods and practices that are necessary to create and sustain these networks of uncalculated giving and to become the thing that we're meant to become. First, as McIntyre says, uh, we have the virtues of what he describes as the virtues of acknowledged dependence, the virtues of uncalculated giving, the virtue of just generosity, giving to others in proportion to their need, the virtue of hospitality, 
giving, uh, sharing with the, the stranger because he or she is a stranger, not because you're seeking anything in return. And the uncalculated giving virtue of misericordia, meaning to, taking, to take on the suffering of another as your own suffering. And that is, and that cashes out in a dramatic fashion in American public bioethics, where the goal is to heal or to comfort. And if that's not possible, merely to accompany the other in his or her suffering. But alongside the gifts are the virtues of, of uncalculated giving, we also have the virtues of graceful receiving. And the most and the, 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 the paradigm virtue of graceful receiving is the virtue of gratitude. And many, many things flow from the virtue of gratitude, the awareness that all is gift. We're here because someone else made our good, their own good, without seeking anything by way of recompense, right? And when you think about that, when you think about that we're only here by virtue of the beneficence of others, it should engender a, a sentiment of pr profound gratitude. And then when you think about the gratitude and you reflect on the gratitude, it, it's, it engenders a kind of spirit of, of humility, right? You realize that all is gift. There's a, and everything you have is, is fundamentally uh, related to these, these first gifts that we've received and these gifts that we continue to receive from others. And then you become alive to the proposition that gifts are not e equally distributed in this world. And so those of us with more gifts have an obligation to find those who are, have less gifts and to care for them in the same way that we were cared for. And gratitude also leads to the practice of what Michael Sandel describes as, he's quoting Bill May, the Protestant theologian Bill May, openness to the unbidden, right? We Rational mastery and controlling our entire universe around us, first of all, is not possible. But second of all, that's not a posture of gratitude. Uh, intolerance of imperfection is not a posture of gratitude when you really think about the things that we receive and our, our very lives themselves as gifts. And this notion of gratitude likewise engenders the, the virtue of solidarity to realize how connected we are to one another by virtue of our shared vulnerability and mutual dependence and embodiment. And of course, it should lead us to embrace the intrinsic equal dignity of all human beings, born and unborn, no matter what their state happens to be. And to understand that some people can participate in the networks of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving merely as the passive recipients of unconditional love. So you don't have to have the sort of cognitive capacities to be able to interrogate the depths of yourself and formulate future directed plans to be counted as a person. You can simply be a person uh, who, who receives uh, the, um, the, the unconditional love of others. Um, obviously truthfulness, the obligation to be truthful with ourselves and with others. But if we take one more step back and we look at all these virtues of both uncalculated giving and graceful receiving, we, we realize that all of them can be understood under the auspices of the concept of friendship, understood in its sort of classical, richest sense, like in Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics. So to practice these virtues, we wanna do things that take ourselves outside of ourselves, that draw our gaze up from inside and upwards and out to look around to others to see who needs our care and assistance. And the paradigm, the pristine paradigm of the network of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving, which I alluded to moments ago, is parenthood. Everyone who's a parent who has been a child, and that covers everybody, you understand how what an extraordinary outpouring of self-sacrificial love parenthood is, especially in those stages where one's child um, is, uh, is unable to reciprocate in any way. Uh, the love and affection that a parent naturally feels for his or her child. Or for that matter, when children take care of their parents uh, later in life, when their parent perhaps passes beyond cognitive function into something like dementia, uh, and all you can, all, all that's left is your, your profound love and uncalculated giving for your, your, your family member who cared for you in, a, in the same way when you were totally vulnerable. As, and so zooming out from the sort of smaller, dyadic relationship of parent and child to the, to the broader notion of community. Communities of memory also, this is a, a phrase that Bella uses, takes, take, the, take us outside of ourselves. We orient our voluntary associations around goods that are greater than our own self-interest, narrowly defined. So given that the paradigm case for uncalculated giving and graceful receiving is the parent-child relationship, I'm going to say a few words briefly about the public bioethics of assisted reproduction and why it is uh, clear that this legal landscape is rooted in a vision of expressive individualism that fails to take on board the essential goods uh, that, that we need for our flourishing uh, and protection. 
So once again, the question we're asking is what vision of the human person and flourishing anchors American law and policy concerning assisted reproduction? Now, I'm not going to get into the details, the fine grained details, but the interesting thing about uh, the law of ART in the United States is that its primary feature is the absence of law. OK, unlike the law of abortion, which is reducible to six or seven Supreme Court cases, and that defines the entire body of law, and it's extremely restrictive on the political branches who can basically only nibble at the edges and regulate in an ancillary way uh, the practice of abortion. Uh, unlike that, the area of, uh, of law concerning assisted reproduction basically is a free-for-all. It, uh, it is an entirely absent, nearly entirely absent uh, space where, where you can essentially, almost essentially, make a baby by whatever means uh, you choose uh, or you prefer or is, is chosen for you by your, uh, by your clinician. And there are lots of reasons why this is, and we can talk about that during the question period. Um, <clears throat> but I will say that the only player in this space that has the resources and the um, uh, a wherewithal to affect legislation and to keep this basically under the aegis of the practice of medicine where, which is regulated by, you know, basically at the front end by licensure and certification of physicians, but that, that's it. And once, once uh, you're licensed and certified, the main regulatory apparatus for the practice of medicine in the United States is the, is the private uh, tort law of malpractice. Again, we can talk about that in the question period if you like, but the group that has uh, most engaged the public square in terms of lobbying and shaping legislation, keeping the field essentially open of most meaningful regulation is uh, are the practices, are, are, the, uh, are, the, are the professional societies, the industry societies, the industry organizations, most prominently the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. And if you want to understand the theoretical underpinnings of this legal landscape, the absence of regulation and law, there's no better place to look than the late Professor John Robertson, uh, former, he recently passed away in the past few years, um, uh, law professor, legal theorist at the University of Texas, who was a permanent fixture of almost every uh, advisory committee on bioethics from the 70s up into his death. But most prominently, he served as chair of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine's Ethics Committee. And if we look to his writings on the sort of normative foundations of the legal landscape, we can learn a lot about why it is the way it is. And what he said in an essential book, a 1994 book called Children of Choice, he said the choice to pursue or avoid procreation is essential to self-definition, the pursuit of desires, and self-expression. Now, that's as concise an articulation of expressive individualism as one could hope to construct. The whole point of reproduction is self-definition, self-expression according to Robertson, who was the architect in many ways of ASRM strategy and the current legal landscape. When I was the general counsel for President Bush's Council on Bioethics, we were studying the question of assisted reproduction and we invited Dr. Gerald Shatton, then of the University of Pittsburgh, famous reproductive endocrinologist, researcher who focused on um, <clears throat> genetic screening as an adjunct to ART. We asked him, what's the point of genetic screening? What's the purpose, the goal of genetic screening? And he had six weeks to think about it, came to our council, looked at the members and said, quote, the goal of genetic screening and assisted reproduction is to help parents realize their dreams of a disease-free legacy. Now you take these two statements and it's pretty striking that you realize both of these gentlemen regard ART as a mechanism, an essential mechanism of self-expression of the parents or the individuals who use it to, to have a child, or in Professor Robertson's case, not merely to have a child that you raise, but also that could include gestational surrogates or even gamete donors themselves. Now, the consequences of a completely lawless landscape for assisted reproduction ends up with, you have uh, the practice of uh, reproductive endocrinology frequently involves the, the, the birth of multiple uh, children, of course, ch all children are a blessing, but multiple gestations are dangerous, both for the mothers and especially for children. Um, we have a million human embryonic human beings in, in freezers in the United States in cryo storage, left over so-called uh, spare embryos, left over from assisted reproductive te technology cycles. And we have widespread screening, not just for diseases, but most commonly for sex selection. Sex selection for, uh, for and, and I don't have to tell you, you can probably imagine, that is mostly 
uh, little um, little girls uh, that are selected out and little boys that are selected in. We have trait selection. We have businesses that are that are providing um, uh, services for trait selection. We have rough forms of genetic engineering, such as reproductive human cloning, which has not been practiced yet in the United States in terms of the production of a live-born child, but that is um, uh, not for the lack of trying. We have markets of gametes where eggs and sperm are sold. And in some cases, eggs are being, uh, young women are being solicited for tens of, uh, many thousands of dollars uh, to sell their, their eggs. Uh, we have uh, surrogacy itself has become a consumer product. This couple you see in this image here, uh, they, uh, they, they contracted with this surrogate uh, who's holding that beautiful little baby with Down syndrome. They found out the baby had Down syndrome in utero. Uh, they demanded that the surrogate uh, get an abortion and, and start over. She, thank goodness, refused. Uh, but you can see the mindset here is one of commodification and consumerism and the idea of commodifying the body uh, itself along with quality assurance and so forth. So the anthropological meaning of this legal landscape is that persons are conceived as individuals pursuing a life, an identity defining plan. The goods at stake are framed in terms of expressive individualism, privacy and choice, and including sex selection, rational mastery, bargain for exchange. And what's missing is embodiment. What's missing is the notion that we live as embodied beings, and that situates us in certain kinds of relationships to one another. It misses our vulnerability, our dependence, our finitude, the relationships among the generations. It misses our reciprocal indebtedness, especially to, to and from our children. Uh, it misses unchosen obligations to vulnerable others. It, it, it sows uh, intolerance of, uh, of, 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 of imperfection. Missing entirely is the tolerance of disability or imperfection. We saw that in the surrogate example a moment ago. And we're certainly missing the notion of openness to the unbidden. We're even missing the very concepts of children, parents, and family. Children and family are understood instead through the lens of the will, a project freely chosen and constructed or rejected for our own ends, sometimes with the aid of technology. It's the parent's dream of a disease-free legacy. There are no unchosen obligations. And the problem here, and this is an argument that I want to be very clear about this, I am not arguing in this book or right now in this lecture that the people who are seeking IVF or ART or sex selection or anything like that uh, have a false understanding of who they are, that they are the expressive individualists. No, what I'm arguing is that the law itself assumes that expressive individualism is, is what a person is and what constitutes human flourishing. And therefore, what the law provides is a mismatch between the lived reality and the needs of such people who are involved in these situations and, the, and, and what the law assumes they need. The law assumes an atomized will seeking to assert his or her unencumbered self and constructs the legal landscape accordingly. But the reality is the patient desperately wants to be a parent, to be embedded in a relationship of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving. And this is a person who is exhausted and probably broke and feels betrayed by their body, betrayed by the very thing that they most want to be, which is to say a parent. And the law doesn't respond to that person where that person is. The law instead gives them the tools of rational mastery in the assertion of the unencumbered self. And that's why, and there are no guardrails in this situation, right? There are no guardrails against unscrupulous practitioners who are offering you sex selection or offering you trait selection or saying, let's, let's implant six embryos to maximize the likelihood of success, of clinical success, even though it's gonna mean more, uh, uh, more multiple gestations or let's create 20 embryos, meaning, knowing that half of them are gonna be in, in a freezer for the next 20 years, right? This is, there's no protection against those temptations from the outside or even the temptations that come from inside. The temptation to do whatever you can do to make the baby that is flesh of your flesh pursuant to your own desires, right? We have to get back to first principles. We fix this with the beginning of an anthropological corrective is the paradigm of parenthood, which means we have to think about the lens through what a child is. And a child is not a project. A, a child is a gift. My old mentor, Leon Cass, chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics in the Bush administration said, a child is a mysterious stranger that one welcomes and loves unconditionally. So we have to ask ourselves when we're evaluating a legal landscape or practices themselves, we have to ask ourselves what forms of procreation align 
with the notion of a child as a gift versus what forms of reproduction reflect the imposition of rational mastery, control, and technology to produce a desired outcome. One is the paradigm of a gift, the paradigm of parenthood, and the other one is a paradigm of project. And we have to measure our laws against this paradigm of parenthood. And to the extent that they depart from it, we need to rein them in. And to the extent that they're hewed closely to it, we know that we're on the right track. So we want to pursue procreation and not baby making. We want, to eat, we want to respect equal dignity of all human beings, born and unborn, not exploiting those who are weak and vulnerable. We want to embrace healing and not enhancement. We want to embrace embodiment, not mere will. Humility, not hubris. Solidarity, not radical individualism. Family, not partnership in mere projects. Love and openness, not force and control. And when we embrace the ethic of giftedness and embrace the child as a gift to be welcomed and loved unconditionally and to understand at every step in the process of, uh, of the medical treatment of infertility, we have to have in mind the end point of this is a child who is welcomed and loved unconditionally. And there are actions that we can take at every single step in that process that are either consistent with that goal or inconsistent with that goal. And the law needs to provide the landscape within which individuals can be protected and they can flourish. So thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to questions and conversation. Thank you, Professor Sneed, for your insightful remarks. Uh, two of Acton's core principles are the inherent dignity of the human person and the social nature of humanity. And your comments provide uh, just a great integration with those comments. Um, and please, if you're, if you're still online, you can submit your questions on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, as well as via email at digital.acton.org. Um, several questions are already coming in, but I wanted to start with one. Um, given the pervasiveness, uh, I mean, Robert Bella talked about multiple kinds of you know, individualism, but uh, given the pervasiveness of uh, expressive individualism in modern culture, is it even possible to reorient or, or recover the ideas that we are mutually dependent, vulnerable, natural limits? I mean, it just seems so antithetical to the way uh, the Western mind, American mind works. I think I was you're muted. muted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, th Dan, thanks. First of all, thank you so much for, again, for inviting me and thanks to your audience for, for their attention. It's great to join you live uh, as well. Um, yeah, no, I agree. It is a, it's a very pervasive kind of mindset, as Bella found in 1985 in his book, Habits of the Heart. Uh, and it's, and it, I don't, there's no evidence at all that it, things have slowed down since then. But the thing is, it's a kind of false mindset, actually, because if you, it, it's, it's a kind of false I don't want to say false consciousness. That wouldn't be the right kind of term to use in an audience for an audience like this. But it's a, it's a kind of misunderstanding, a fundamental misunderstanding of one's place in the world. It's an illusion, right? And because it's an illusion, it generates certain kinds of pathologies and cognitive dissonance. People feel disoriented, destabilized. Uh, when you can't really define yourself according, to, I mean, and I should say, I mean, there's some truth in it, obviously, we are free, we are particular, uh, we are individuals, and there is value in interrogating the depths of the self for uh, finding, you know, authenticity and truth and to, and to help understand one's life plan and one's destiny. But it's not the whole truth. That's the problem. It's defective because it's not the whole truth. And inexorably, because we're embodied beings, we live situated in relationship to one another in a communal setting and with families and communities and, you know, in, in, in nations even in the world. Uh, and we have certain kinds of obligations to one another, chosen and unchosen. And I think everybody kind of knows that or at least feels at an intuitive level, but if you're maintaining a self-understanding that is false to that reality and only applies, again, as I said in my remarks, at best, at a very you know, privileged snapshot in our, in our life's trajectory, it creates a kind of, um, again, dislocation and, and sort of, and, and, and Solzhenitsyn talks about, you know, there's a sort of, it's, de it's a death-haunted existence. When you're the only thing that really exists in the universe, your death constitutes the termination of that universe. And that's a different kind of existential dread that people live with who really try to embrace the notion of expressive individualism. So I think that we are, I mean, I think that 
we're kind of living according to a, a self-invented mythology when a destructive one when we when we embrace this particular viewpoint. But I do think that there's signs of the pathology, sort of paradoxically, the kind of tribalism and polarization and and embrace of identity politics that we see nowadays, especially among young people, reflects a kind of desire for belonging, which is the likes of you know, which is which is a function of our our relationship and our embeddedness in these kinds of stories and narratives and relationships to one another. So I think there it is possible. I mean, it's not just possible; it's necessary to kind of to 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 be honest with ourselves and with others, and more importantly, not more importantly, as importantly, to encode in the law and public policy a vision of human identity and human flourishing that is accurate to our lived reality. And and I will say this, I mean, as a law professor, I mean, I understand it is true, of course, that law in some ways is shaped by culture and reflects cultural norms and goods and things that people care about. Law also shapes culture. Law is is um, is not doesn't merely reflect the goods that people hold dear, but it also uh, is constitutive and pedagogical of what goods people should hold dear, for better or worse. I mean, law law is a, a teacher, for better or worse. It's a highly imperfect teacher, but people do take their bearings from what the law holds. And I think one answer to the question of how do we change our thinking about this is I think we have to we have to, through our legal deliberations, our public policy deliberations, have open conversations about human personhood, human flourishing, get onto the table what our priors about those issues are, and then and move from there to, to law and policy as opposed to not ever talking about it and relying upon this false understanding, uh, whether it be for in the context of assisted reproduction, which, which I took up in my remarks, where we're really talking about a landscape that is missing a real meaningful regulatory framework, which provides a certain kind of very um, narrowly defined freedom to do something, to, to make a baby by whatever means uh, you choose almost, uh, which is not, again, what people, and that's a kind of false, That's that reality arises from a false impression that the law assumes about what people are and what they need in those settings. People who are suffering from infertility, as I said, don't need a world of wide open choice without with no guardrails at all, no protections for them from unscrupulous clinicians or or businesses or even, as I said, from their own temptations that can squarely contradict their own obligations and the things that they genuinely want to embrace, namely parenthood which should at its best imply a relationship that is focused on a child who is loved and welcomed unconditionally. So the sort of one sentence answer to your question is, I think the law has a significant role to play in, in shaping people's understanding about who and what human flourishing really is. Cause I think we know it. I think, and I think a lot of the pathologies that we're experiencing psychologically, culturally, socially flow from trying to hold on to a vision about who we are that's false. It, we can't hold on to it. And it, it, the pathology is a manifestation of not living in the truth. For sure. And, and do you think um, in, in your expertise in medical ethics and the legal in, engagement with that, um, in, in medical and technological ethics, it seems that the pace at which innovation and entrepreneurship is happening, that, that the laws, if you will, are... are some would argue a decade or two behind the speed at which the technological innovation is happening. Do, do you find that correlative or, or, or accurate? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think it's true. I mean, public bioethics has historically been a field of law and policy that is reactive, and it's usually reactive to scandals. Um, so we end up with law and policy once something happens that maybe certain prophetic voices were warning about, but now it's happening, it's here, and what are we going to do? And a lot of times it's trying to close a barn door after the horse is already, For sure. already out. Um, the good news is, is that the ethical principles that I think are most rich and useful and fruitful are not, don't need to be developed. They're already here. I mean, the concept of human flourishing, the concept of the virtues and goods that are essential for human flourishing that I talk about in my remarks are, are very old ideas and can be adapted and used. The question is what, you know, what does government do? What do the courts do? What are the, you know, what are, what are the different organs of the state do in response to these kinds of scandals? Um, and in the, in the book, and I have a whole chapter dedicated to the history of American public bioethics that sort of takes three signal events and shows exactly how reactive the laws in this area are. So the, 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 the trick here is to be thoughtful 
about the kind of perennial goods that we care about, human freedom, human dignity, human equality, uh, and other, you know, the other aspects of human flourishing, and try to build frameworks that, uh, while they're not directly responsive to specific technologies or clinical innovations, they can easily be adapted to those things, rather than having to respond quickly and imperfectly to uh, by things you know like you hear that two babies in china are born whose genomes have been edited uh you know basically for an enhancement purpose not even for for a a therapeutic purpose in response to a pathology that those children suffer from but rather to enhance their natural resistance to a particular malady in that case it was hiv um i mean what do you do then like i I mean what do you do when when a when there's the birth of an actual and it's never happened as far as we know a cloned human child or, uh, or we get better at genetic engineering, uh, even than uh, with respect to the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. Right. Or there's some issue that comes up that we can't even formulate, uh, 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 you know, the 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 language to to talk about in anticipation of it because it's so, it's going to be so innovative and interesting and creative and dangerous and scary and exhilarating all at the same time. I mean, science is and produces and and the extraordinarily brilliant people who work in these technical fields, I mean, they, they bring about amazing inter- innovations that really can relieve man's estate, really can function, and in many cases do function for the human flourishing of, of individuals and, and the common good. But um, but the problem is, is that science, as we all know, science and technology are morally neutral tools that simply that simply can be applied to whatever purpose we, you know, the, 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 the person applying them chooses. And so we have to have we have to have a, a at least begin with a conversation at the in a public way about these goods and harms so that we can we can build fences that will allow us to benefit from these uh, technologies and innovations but won't um, won't drag us into places that are dangerous or dehumanizing and and somebody from the audi- the live stream audience asked a question very similar they they asked do you see an ethical distinction between genetic engineering used to treat disease, which alters only non-inheritable DNA, and yeah. between genetic engineering, which alters heritable DNA. Absolutely. No, there's a, a very clear difference between those two things. So just for your audience, I mean, there are different genetic interventions that are even being used now in clinical in a clinical context. Uh, you know, they call it, it, it's, it's, it's called gene transfer research is the, is the term of art that's used and gene transfer research can be used to, to, uh, to modify the genetic constitution or the epigenetic constitution of a particular individual to try to silence the function of some genes or to activate, uh, other genes for the sake of a therapeutic end. Uh, they've, there've been a lot of clinical trials involving these questions. And and the world of gene transfer research can be divided up into what's called somatic gene transfer research or somatic gene modification, which are the modification of those genes in the human genome that are not, that that don't create a heritable change, meaning uh, they don't create a change that is passed on to successive generations through uh, to to one's offspring. uh, The the kinds of genetic modifications, usually to the sex cells of the of the individual that that do create heritable changes are called germline modifications. Germline referring to the the gametes that are that are modified or the or the or the production of gametes that are modified. So such that when you have offspring, you have mutual, I mean you have you have multiple successive generations with that exact same change. Somatic cell gene therapy or somatic gene therapy where you're actually only change, making non-heritable changes, the fundamental ethical question there, as long as we're talking about therapy, which in some ways can become complicated, the distinction between therapy and enhancement requires you to right. define sort of health as a baseline and uh, you know, from which departures constitute either therapy or enhancement. The main ethical question, as long as you're talking about therapy, is has to do with safety and efficacy and 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 all the questions of autonomy involving protecting human subjects and and making sure it's voluntary and those people who aren't who can't give voluntary consent or their interests are being protected. Those are the. I mean, those are not. They aren't hard. They aren't really hard questions, ethically speaking, any harder than any other kind of um, intervention that we make in an individual. Uh, that the changes of which are not heritable. The com- the complexities arrive when we get into the question of heritable genetic changes. Again, I'm bracketing for the moment changes that are 
for enhancement purposes rather than for merely therapeutic purposes. I'm strictly talking about therapeutic purposes. Can we talk about enhancement? Then we have an entire new sort of landscape of ethical questions to, to, to grapple with. And for those people that are interested in those questions, I would commend uh, the President's Council on Bioethics report, Beyond Therapy, uh, uh, under Chairman Leon Cass. I had the privilege to serve as general counsel to the President's Council on Bioethics from 2002 to 2005. And within that period, we produced a report, which is available online right now. Just Google President's Council on Bioethics, Beyond Therapy, and you can read the entire report. And it's about human aspirations and medical interventions that are oriented towards advancing human aspirations and how to understand uh, what constitutes therapy, that is restoring a pathological condition to a range of normal functioning versus enhancement, which is to take people's normal functioning beyond the normal for, uh, to, to, for you know, to, to follow the wills or wishes or desires of someone, perhaps the patient, some, perhaps some third party. Uh, that's to my mind still the most interesting reflection on the question of enhancement versus therapy. But when you're talking about germline gene modification, you have to ask several questions about how do you think about obligations to successive generations that don't yet exist? And who is the patient? How do you understand, how do you define the standard of care? Uh, and there are all kinds of very complicated questions. So div dis dividing the world between somatic gene modification and germline gene modification is an essential distinction, the former of which is much less vexing from an ethical perspective than the latter. That's good, thank you. Um, one other one from uh, online is, to what extent is the language of rights helpful or harmful in public bioethics? Yeah, I mean, it can be helpful and harmful, right? So it's helpful in a way because it's a, it's a lexicon that we're familiar with, the notion of human rights or, or, or individual liberties. Those are things that especially Americans are comfortable with, uh, and, 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 it's, and it can be valuable to sort of translate different kinds of goods and, uh, and, and, and interests into kind of a, a linguistic frame that we're all familiar with. So it can be useful and it, it's of course, it has legal significance as well, right? I mean, there are human rights is a, is, a, is a branch of law, international human rights. We talk about rights and protected liberty interests and fundamental rights within the constitutional framework of the United States. And we have an entire jurisprudence that uses that language. We use that language in our political sphere when, we're talk, when we, we talk about my rights versus your rights. I mean, so it is, it is embedded in our tradition that we use that language. And so it can be helpful in that way. But there's also, there are also risks involved in using the language of rights because the language of rights is necessarily uh, an atomizing kind of locution for reasons that my colleague Alistair McIntyre and Marianne Glennon, who has a wonderful book called Rights Talk, which kind of explains uh, the perils of relying exclusively on the notion of rights um, to try to to try to define, you know, the the the, the zones in, into which uh, I can make a claim for my my own interests, into which the state can't, without very good reasons, uh, interfere with. And then there, of course, there are questions of positive rights and negative rights. If I have a positive right, does the state have an obligation to provide me with the material resources necessary to exercise that right versus a negative right, which is merely the right to be left alone? Um, so, but even saying that right now, you can kind of hear the problem with the reliance, sort of simple-minded reliance on rights talk because it's isolating, right? It's me, it's my interests, and, and, you, and you run the risk of kind of embracing the expressive individualism that I criticize in the book. So, um, I mean, there are goods that we care about, there are ends that we pursue, there are other words that we can use and should use alongside the word, the, 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 the terms of, of human rights and rights. We just need to really be mindful of the kind of, the, 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 the foundation in which those, the sort of anthropological foundation in which our rights talk rests. And then of course you have the deeper question of what, where do rights come from? Right, that's an even more deeper and sort of more interesting question. If a right is merely an entitlement granted by the state at the sufferance of the state or at the at the at the discretion of the state, that's not really a right in the sense that we uh, an inviolable sort of protection that I enjoy by virtue of you know of of, of what exactly, right? But by virtue of the fact that uh, I'm a human being and have human dignity, or the fact that I'm created in the image and likeness of God. I mean, the question of where do rights come from and why should we respect them is a very deep question that we frequently sort of skate over when we're talking about rights, either in the international or the domestic sphere. No, that's very good. And uh, the rights language can um, embed itself, it seems, in the expressive individualism culture. Um, 
the, and, and so the modern version, one, one modern version someone asks is, in the context of the current pandemic, is expressive individualism a way to explain the dilemma that we are experiencing between people who do want to get vaccinated, for example, and those who do not? Well, I think there is something to that. Uh, I mean, I, th I think in so I mean, you have to listen to what people's reasoning is. Or like, I mean, I, I would be very hesitant to generalize why people do or don't get vaccinated, right? I mean, there are a lot of different reasons. So, but I'm certain that it's for some folks, um, uh, the, some of the arguments that you hear about don't tell me what to do. I can, you know, I have my, I have my own, uh, it's it's my body, my choice. I can. These are the kinds of arguments that you hear frequently invoked in the abortion context, but you also hear them in sort of libertarian circles with respect to vaccine mandates and those kinds of things. And and there's a. I mean, the American political landscape right now is very scrambled and kind of. I mean, there, there's so many pathologies at work in our in our political discourse in our political relationships to one another it's kind of hard to to point to one one right. problem right i mean uh, it's and you sit back and you listen to the debates and and there's a lot of reasons to be disappointed and a lot of reasons to be uh, scandalized and even despondent about our political culture at the moment especially i mean the pandemic itself has 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 aggravated this problem it's not people's fault that they're that they're in the that, that, that they're that their thinking has been shaped by you know these these unbelievable pressures and this 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 unprecedented at least in our lifetimes lockdowns and and uh and fears about the transmission of disease and government mandates and then questions about you know approval processes and then questions about the derivation of the the cell lines that were involved in the creation of these vaccines in different ways and whether or not that implicates a person in the context of the abortion of the unborn child who happened decades ago from whom the tissue was used to divert to, you know, to derive the cell line that it was either used to test the vaccines or in some cases to produce the vaccines. I mean, these are very complicated and interesting questions, but it's for sure the case that people have said, you know, don't tell me what to do. I get to decide for myself what I do. Um, and, and a lot of those arguments sound, and, and I have my own vision of, and self-understanding that comes from inside, that it's not uh, accountable to any tradition or community or common good, uh, and therefore I get, to, I get to do what I want. And that's an argument that sounds a lot like it's rooted in expressive individualism, and there's certain people making that argument, although I want to be fair, there are people who are making arguments for and against vaccine mandates that are root rooted in more sophisticated and complicated and interesting arguments. Um, but for sure, people's resistance to being told what to do frequently can be a manifestation of the embrace of expressive individualism. Also, people's embrace of virtue signaling in different contexts can also be an expression of expressive individualism, right? And the idea that one can simply live virtually and not an embodied life in which you are physically present with others can be a reflection of expressive individualism. I mean, my, my worries that I observed during the lockdown was this kind of, in thinking about risk and calculating risk, not taking seriously enough the, the worries about embodied life and the flourishing of embodied beings, which requires being together, right? And being together in an, in an embodied way, not simply looking at a screen or being on social media. I mean, even though we're doing that, and it's wonderful that we're doing that right now, it's a great way to talk to each other. And, um, and I'm happy to be Zooming with you right now and with your audience. But um, but the, one of the worries that I have is that I mean the most haunting image that I saw one of the most haunting images that I saw from the during the pandemic was a, a dying patient who had a, a, a surgical glove rubber glove filled with warm water resting on his chest because it simulated human touch right, right. and you can you can appreciate and admire the innovative spirit of the technicians and physicians and nurses that did that to try to at least simulate that. But when we're keeping dying people apart from one another who've been married for 50 or 60 years uh, uh, and they can't even be physically present in the same room together, I think we're undervaluing the goods and uh, that are necessary for human flourishing in an embodied life. So I think there's a lot of concerns, both from the uh, risk calculus side and expressive individualism and the sort of embrace of those vocations that don't require in-person contact and kind of forgetting our neighbors and friends and loved ones who work in vocations that do require in and the kind of burdens that they've experienced as a result of the lockdown. But then also, I I'm not sympathetic to a lot of the sort of more expressive individual arguments against 
vaccinations and masking and social distancing either. So, I mean, it's, there's not, there's no, I don't think we can lay at one side or the other an embrace of expressive individualism. I think both sides have embraced expressive individualism different ways. Um, and I think both sides have embraced uh, the corrective for expressive individualism in both ways. I think the kinds of folks that have wanted to embrace more in-person physical interactions are, 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 are nurturing the virtues of embodied life and the people who are deeply concerned about the common good and urging people to get vaccinated and wearing masks and protecting the vulnerable are also operating from a, a sort of anthropology of embodiment that's admirable as well. So I think I think there's a lot, a lot, there's too much going on in this debate to generalize. Although I, one generalization I am comfortable with is I think that our political discourse and our political interactions right now are very, very problematic and very sick. Yeah. Well, Professor Sneed, thank you for reminding us on some of these core principles about what it means to be human. Thank you for being on the cutting edge of these topics, for, especially from the, the legal perspective and uh, presenting cogent thoughts on this topic. If you want to read more about and, and dig deeper into what Professor Sneed was talking about, please do pick up what it means to be human. It is a, a very fascinating and in-depth volume. So thank you again for being with us.